beekeeper. What is killing the bees? These are the two questions that I get asked almost every single day. Well, I think I was born a beekeeper, and we're killing the bees. Those are the short answers. Now I'm gonna give you the long answers. For the answer to the first question, let's rewind back a few years. My first sentence <laughs> was, I pooped my pants because you took my squirt gun away from me. <laughs> so when I wasn't shooting my mom in the face with my squirt gun, I was out in the backyard hunting bugs. And one morning, I squirted a honeybee on a dandelion. And I instantly felt bad because I found out when bees are wet, they can't fly. So I picked her up to dry her off and zing, did I get the shock of my life. My first honeybee sting. So I was just completely shocked and fascinated that something so small could be so incredibly powerful. My next experience with honeybees was a bit more positive. My aunt had a small farm in the backwoods of Southern Oregon. And a friend of hers had a few honeybee hives, couple honeybee hives on this farm. I was, again, fascinated. Fascinated with the bees. Fascinated with the beekeeper. I loved his smoker and his duct taped coveralls and his veil. I would follow him around, and one hot, sunny summer day, he gave me a chunk of honeycomb straight from the beehive. Have you ever had warm honey straight from the beehive? It is amazing. Put it on your bucket list. It is like taking a trip to Nirvana and a rocket ship with your mouth. <laughs> In one bite, you get to thankfully devour the work of hundreds of honeybees and thousands of flowers. These experiences planted a seed with me, a seed of fascination, and I carried that with me for quite a long time. Fast forward to the end of high school. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I didn't have a lot of direction. My life felt like a blank slate. I tried a lot of things. College, a few times. Boyfriends, lots of them. <laughs> I went out to Colorado and tried my hand at ski school and horse wrangling. I even went down to Hollywood. <laughs> and eventually, I made my way up to Alaska for a couple years, where I worked on a commercial fishing boat. I was a firefighter. I did search and rescue. And I was a hiking guide. <laughs> but none of these things really held on to me. If you can believe it, none of them captivated me. I didn't feel like any of these things were my passion or what I really should be doing. None of them felt like the biggest adventure I could have. So one day, I hit the glass ceiling in my bustling Alaskan town of 700. And I decided to give one last stab at my college degree. I knew I wanted to study resource conservation, but I wasn't really sure where I wanted to study. That was until I found Montana. The University of Montana had beekeeping as a work study. Beekeeping as a work study. How cool is that? My decision was instantly made. My path was clear. I headed south, and I went to, uh, I went to UM. And my first beekeeping mentor was a UM honeybee researcher named Scott Debnam also known as the Shirtless Bee Whisperer. <laughs> With only my hands sticking out of my full head-to-toe suit, I would routinely get stung. And Scott, wearing half the clothes as me, would never get stung. He would tell me, Sarah, the bees might really like you, but they love me. Challenge accepted, Scott. I was going to get the bees to love me, too. So in this journey to get the bees to love me, I found some really cool things, a few of which I'd love to share with you today. 
Honeybees can be trained to sniff bombs. True story. <laughs> Bee venom is actually used to destroy HIV cells. And honeybees prefer flowers with caffeinated nectar. It actually helps them work a little faster <laughs> and remember more. <laughs> True story. Honeybees also recognize human faces. And yes, that is me kissing the business end of a honeybee. <laughs> so in this quest, in this journey, in this adventure to get my honeybees to love me, I ended up completely falling in love with them. And I'm proud to say that I am now in my first ever successful long-term relationship <laughs> with the honeybee. And uh, no, it's not uncommon for a beekeeper to be walking around with a queen bee in her pocket this time of year. So that is my story with the honeybees. What about your story with the honeybees? It doesn't matter if you have a really deep, intrinsic connection to them like I do. You need your honeybees. One out of every three bites of food you eat is pollinated by a honeybee. They bring vitamins and minerals and healthy fats to your table. They bring color and flavor to your plates and to your lives. If we lived in a world without honeybees, we would live in a world with a lot of rice, a lot of oatmeal, a lot of creams corn, and also scurvy. <laughs> but our honeybees are in trouble. It doesn't matter if you have two hives in your backyard or 20,000 hives spread all across the country. Our honeybees are in trouble. This is the hardest time to keep your bees and keep your bees alive and healthy that we have ever had. In fact, if we were to line up all of the bee boxes, so the beehives where a colony of bees lives, all of the bees that have been lost since this colony collapse disorder started in about 2006, those boxes would stretch from Bend, Oregon to Madison, Wisconsin. So what is killing the honeybees? Is it a mystery malady like we read above the fold every couple of weeks or um, hear in the news? Just yesterday morning I heard a story on the news and, and it was started off by saying, mystery bee collapses happening again. Is it a mystery what's killing our honeybees? No, it's not a mystery. It's the varroa mite. It's chemically intensive monocrop farming. It's climate change. And it's habitat loss. So habitat loss to me is a biggie because it makes everything else up here, it magnifies it. It makes all those other issues worse and harder to deal with. Um, we oftentimes don't think of the Midwest when we think of honeybees. When we think of prairie, we think of kind of expansive grassland. Well, that expansive grassland is full of flowers. Flowers as far as the eye can see. And flowers are honeybee food. In fact, the majority of our bees and our beekeepers live in the Midwest. However, we are losing our honeybee food. We're losing our habitat. We're losing our honeybee habitat. Just in North and South Dakota and Nebraska, since 2006, so that's less than a decade, we have lost 1.5 million acres of honeybee forage, of prairie, to fence row, to fence row corn and soy plantings. 1.5 million acres is the size of 767 Deschutes counties, gone in less than 10 years. And that's not only honeybee food, that's habitat for our native bees, it's habitat for our birds, it's habitat for our butterflies, our amphibians, and a lot of other wildlife. So, <laughs> there is good news. There is good news there um, is a upswell of backyard beekeepers right now, which is awesome for the, the local farming movement and the, and the urban farming movement because those community gardens and those rooftop gardens really need pollination. However, I'm not really sure if 
if community gardens and rooftop gardens are gonna feed seven billion mouths. So, is sustainable, bee-friendly agriculture doable on a very large scale? I say absolutely. A colleague of mine worked with a farmer in the highly industrialized area of a highly industrialized area in the Midwest of Minnesota. They took 2,000 acres of a seed farm. The farmer's goal was to increase production and save money. That's what all farmers want, to increase production and save money. So they went at it in a bit more of a holistic manner. They monitored before they sprayed pesticides. They reduced tillage to protect their little ground nesting bee families. They used herbicides selectively to avoid damaging the beneficial insects. They burned weeds to reduce chemical usage. And they reduced mowing to create buffer strips, really happy places for those bees and those beneficial bugs to live. Well, the inputs went down, the profits went up. They saved money on pesticides, herbicides, they had free pollinators. This is good for farmers, it's good for bees, and it's good for you and me and our health as well. So I really encourage you to support our farmers and support our land managers to farm the best, conserve the rest. It can happen, and it can happen on a large scale. We need a paradigm shift in our, the way we eat food. Right now, we only eat 5%, 5% of our food is organically farmed, only 5%. We need a paradigm shift in the way we eat our food. And you get to be part of that. It's really awesome to live at this time in this place where we get to be part of the solution. We get to get that pendulum swinging back in the right direction. So now, I am going to give you my top four tips on how to save the bees. Tip number one, this is something we need to do on a national level. Ask for good honeybee policy. Contact your lawmakers. Contact the White House. Ask them what they're doing for honeybees. They really do want to hear from you. They really do. Please call them, send them an email. Ask them what they're doing for bee policy. On a community level, vote with your fork. Michael Pollan said, we change the natural world by our eating choices more than anything else we do. We change the natural world by our eating choices more than anything else that we do. So vote with your fork. Plant flowers. Everybody can do this. On a household level, everybody can do this. Plant flowers with your kids, with your partner, with your roommates, plant flowers. Everybody in this room has access to some dirt and some seeds at some levels. Plant flowers on ranches, plant flowers on farms, plant flowers in your front yard, in your backyard, along fence rows, in your garden, in a window box, in a planter on your front porch, plant flowers. The backyard beekeeping movement is awesome, but those girls need support. It takes bees visiting approximately two million flowers to fill up this jar of honey. Two million flowers to fill up this one jar of honey. If everybody in this room was to plant this little packet of flower seeds, we would have 70,000 square feet of additional flowers. 70,000 square feet of additional bee food for our girls, plant flowers. And number four, make a space in your heart. This is what you can do at an individual level. Please love your bees, at least just a little bit. Appreciate them for what they do for you. Adopt a bee, plant a seed. Thank you. <laughs>